delighted to be here in my capacity as chair of the, of, of the committee of the office of the First Minister uh, and Deputy First Minister. Uh, we have presentations addressing uh, general themes today uh, with regard to a shared society, but we will also focus in on three very important uh, policy areas. The first is tackling sectarianism. The second is shared education. And the third is the removal uh, of interface barriers. Each policy uh, featured, of course, in the executives together building a united uh, community strategy. Now, the necessity for tackling sectarianism in our society is woven into each aspect of the strategy. And Dr. Duncan Morrow uh, of Ulster University uh, will talk to you about Scotland's consideration of sectarianism and how to tackle it there. And that will shed light uh, on how we approach the issue here. I know Duncan has done uh, a lot of research uh, working in Glasgow uh, and around, uh, around Scotland. The establishment of 10 shared education campuses and the removal of all interface barriers by 2023 are two of the seven headline actions of the executive strategy. So uh, Dr. Gavin Duffy uh, and I think Professor Tony Gallagher, hopefully Tony Gallagher from Queen's will, will also be joining us, providing some insights from the sharing education programme regarding schools collaboration in a contested society. And then uh, Drs. Johnny Byrne and Duncan Morrow and Professor Cathy Gormley-Heenan of Ulster University uh, will look at the factors and issues around the removal of interface barriers by the executive's target date of 2023. And I've heard Cathy talking about uh, the research she has done before, and it is absolutely fascinating and very, very informative for people trying to uh, formulate and then implement a strategy. Uh, the committee I chair has made the oversight of the implementation of TBUC uh, a strategic priority. We, we, included, we concluded an, an inquiry, by the way, uh, in July of this year. It wasn't a review. We weren't trying to rewrite it. We were simply looking uh, to hear from stakeholders about the, how that strategy was progressing and to make some recommendations to support and enhance policy in this area. The committee noted that there's no single approach to building a united community. Each local community requires a uniquely tailored approach and programs and initiatives must be flexible enough to accommodate the nuances uh, while still working towards the same goal. So the committee came to a number of conclusions and it made a series of recommendations for the implementation of the strategy. However, we acknowledge the report is not the end of the conversation uh, and as a committee we will remain engaged uh, on this subject. And I'll finish just on a personal note, if I may, just one observation. It's my first mandate uh, up here at Stormont. And as an elected rep, the longer I'm here, uh, the more I believe that the mature thing for us to do as an executive and an assembly uh, is to de devolve power off this hill, devolve power back off the hill through councils and into communities. And up here, we should stick to strategy and to vision. So uh, a united community, that's a vision. But how you deliver it should not be up to us. I think we need to stop printing the very detailed delivery manuals uh, with all the tick boxes in it, which if communities don't tick the boxes, then they don't get the cash. I mean, if you look out the windows, if the windows were open, if the blinds were open, you would see we're in the leafy suburbs of the Upper Newton Arts Road, how people out there delivered shared space and a shared future. It would be very different uh, from two miles near Belfast City Centre on the lower. Newton Arts Road, and how they do it on the lower Newton Arts Road would be very different from Dungiven, which would be different from Portaferry or from Newry or even parts of Newry. And I think we should be relaxed and trust people in their own communities to tell us how they will give meaning to the vision that we set up here as an assembly. So I, I welcome this seminar very much as part of the ongoing conversation. Uh, as ever, uh, I have to leave to chair uh, the regular Wednesday committee. Uh, meeting of OFM DFM. So I will just move to the rear, uh, listen until the time comes, and then slip away quietly. But once again, you're all extremely welcome. Uh, and I welcome our speakers and look forward to their presentations. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, something about my own involvement in this. Um, I was asked to chair a committee on behalf of the Scottish Government looking into the whole question of sectarianism and also trying to establish some rules, some basis on which that might be done. Um, these 
arise out of that experience and also out of what I learnt on it and also some of the research findings that emerged as a consequence of what we tried to do. And in the first instance, it's, it's a kind of a reportage on what approach was taken there and then some reflections a little bit on what might be learnt in relation to that in terms of tackling an issue which clearly has uh, relevance and echoes here. First of all, um, sectarianism in Scotland too has proved to be historically a very difficult challenge to address. It's always been in the too hard box, partly because it was seen to raise very significant social issues which tackled some quite significant vested interests and that the consequences of raising it might actually outweigh the consequences of letting it fester. That of course depends on where you're looking at it from and uh, as here it has a number of complex routes. One of the difficulties we came across very early was trying to get a handle on something which connects linguistically to religion but has taken leave of a narrow context of that and has actually shaped a whole set of social relations which have more or less connection to those origins but uh, that dilutes as you go past and therefore it becomes a, a, actually a whole complex of things and part of the difficulty of giving it something concise is that it tends to flatter us with the notion that that leads to very easy policy. It doesn't. It's a whole series of things in practice which require to be unpicked and I suppose that won't be particular news to you. Um, just by way of introduction, undoubtedly uh, part of the problem is it doesn't even come from a single route. You start from broad European religious routes which created rivalries in religious groups and ideologies around those which have had echoes not just in these islands but right across the western part of the continent and continue to do so. Um, it has a British root in the sense that the British state was formed at some point in, in relation to that and in 1701 and 1705 in Scotland the Act of Settlement made clear that the defence of freedom in the state according to those who were designing it depended on Protestantism in the monarchy and that has created a sense of structural difference between Catholics and Protestants running through the whole of the, of the um, United Kingdom from the beginning and that is a, an additional issue. And then there's the third issue which is that sectarianism was a confrontation particularly in industrialisation. Uh, at one stage during the famine 43,000 Irish emigrants arrived in Glasgow between uh, January and April 1848 and thousands and thousands of people it's uh, akin to the type of movement we're seeing from Syria in many ways uh, of the type of numbers who were coming and to actually radically transforming the west of Scotland and at the same time transforming the eastern part of Ulster. So the development of Belfast and Glasgow and Liverpool in many ways have extremely big historical parallels and nevertheless they have their own distinctivenesses. And the final thing I'd say by way of introduction is the um, the, the, this, is, this is a subject which, is, which divides us by the language, as it were. It is sometimes not helpful at all to try to make parallels because the context and the political context that have emerged, particularly since 1920 and partition in Ireland, uh, have been very distinct and very different and have given it its own pathway. So there are limits to the level of parallel that we can draw in this. Nevertheless, one of the things that's clear is that pre-devolution there was no active policy framework to address this. Uh, government at every stage simply overrode it. That's not to say it wasn't part of politics. In Glasgow and in Edinburgh in the 1930s, uh, sectarian-based parties won 25% of the vote in the council elections in both of those uh, cities. And the Church of Scotland and the Catholic Church uh, had statement after statement after statement around these things, particularly up to the 1950s. It seems to have disappeared from view in two steps. One, in the 1950s, where the arrival of the welfare state and the restructuring of the Scottish economy changed the way in which people were employed so that it wasn't quite on the same sectarian pattern as been there before. And secondly, uh, in the 1970s, when crisis arised, arose in Northern Ireland. And actually, there is no doubt whatsoever that the crisis here, and particularly the, the, the eruption of violence as a daily reality, uh, created a distance between the Scottish experience and the Northern Ireland experience. Instead of making it more acute, in some sense it went underground. 
But that's not to say it wasn't part of everyday society, particularly in certain towns and cities. And as here, but probably more so, the variety based on locality is enormous. The difference between Motherwell and uh, Coatbridge and Airdrie and towns in the north of Scotland like Montrose in relation to this issue is gigantic. And so trying to find policy which fits and trying to address it is extremely difficult. But in the early uh, years of the Scottish Parliament, 2002, a cross-party working group was established in some ways, and this is me speaking, to outflank the potential of a, a backbench bill. A bank, bench, bank, backbench bill was being introduced to ban this, the singing of sectarian songs uh, in, in um, football matches and to try to get a grip on what was seen as a permissive environment for sectarian expression, but also for violence resulting from it. And they set up a working group called... Uh, working group on possible legislation to tackle religious hatred in Scotland. So there you go. They have a, don't go for Coca-Cola type slogans there either. At which they came up with the conclusion that there were strong arguments for legislation, but these should not overshadow the need for changes in practice, culture and attitudes to combat religious prejudice on a wider front. Which highlights the dilemma at the core of this and still at the core of anybody who has to consider this in policy matters. At one level, the seriousness of this is obvious, and the chronic nature of the issue is obvious and can be uh, charted and identified. At another level, the introduction of legislation is sometimes very difficult to calibrate to the level that you actually need to calibrate it, because it can, by itself, cause as many problems as it solves. But that's not to say that, in fact, it, it does the opposite. It, it emphasises that action short of legislation becomes almost more important. And that action, however, tends to sink from public view if it's not backed by legislation. And so this dilemma of whether we move to legislation, which is, if you like, too hard and too blunt, or avoid legislation and then it avoids and tends to uh, reduce the importance of the issue, remains a constant dilemma, and a dilemma very clearly that the Scottish Government recognised. Nevertheless, the development of this is very clear. Um, they, following on from the, um, from the uh, working group, they reviewed marches and parades, and the OR report came up with a whole series of recommendations, many of which uh, are part of the kind of code of conduct version of uh, parades and marches that we have here in, Nor in Northern Ireland now. The summit on sectarianism uh, was called by Jack McConnell, who was then the First Minister, uh, was called the football summit because the core issue in Scotland has been that there are actually institutions at social level which appear to be very closely tied to uh, a mass support and an emotive uh, context uh, associated very closely with, with football. And that football is not simply a game. Football is more than life itself, as they say. But they, it is also something which generates on a weekly basis opportunities for demonstration and for that to spill out into other aspects of social life. Um, the action plan which came forward in 2006 introduced the notion of football banning orders. Um, it also introduced small scale funding for organisations to begin to engage in this. This is in some sense way behind what happened here. And uh, the Old Firm Alliance, this group of uh, the two major football clubs, Rangers and Celtic and Glasgow, at least making some kind of effort to demonstrate that they believed that there were limits to the rivalry that had to occur and that they would intervene in Glasgow schools um, to connect this. The role for councils as the key element in regulating marches and parades was uh, underpinned by the Police, Public Order and Criminal Justice Scotland Act of 2006. And in 2009, when Jack McConnell was uh, reflecting on his time, he uh, said that the thing that he regretted most that he had not done enough about sectarianism. But essentially, in Scotland, it, has, it moved between two points, what might be called the megaphone and silence. Sectarianism was either dealt with as a highly emotive issue in which there was very little room for manoeuvre, or it was dealt with as an uh, issue which was silent and which everybody was very quiet. And just as a, an aside, I had to put two pieces of um, reflection into the press during my period as the chair of the committee. 
and in the first, which, uh, which came into the Glasgow Herald, it set off a minor firestorm because somebody in the Catholic press office said it was Scotland's Alabama issue. It was the closest thing to civil rights that had not been addressed ever in Scotland, and that rumbled on for about three weeks. And when I, six months later, put a piece in Scotland on Sunday, um, the response was, why are you raising this? This is an issue that's dying on its own and shouldn't be being talked about in public. And so uh, the move from this is the most important issue to this is an issue you shouldn't be talking about at all also has similarities uh, to the difficulties of finding the right size to approach this with. Does it overwhelm? Or in fact, if you don't deal with it, does it just simply fester and continue to damage uh, community life? The actual trigger for change was came from football, came from a series of events which were, first of all, tied up with behaviour at an old, fir old firm match which drew in the managers, um, McCoist and, uh, McCoist and uh, Lennon, and then followed up by bullets being sent in the post to Neil Lennon, leading to a, if you like, tilt in that argument to say something has to be done about this. This is a consistent and real issue still alive in Scotland and still causing grounds for significant public involvement. The SNP, which up to that point had probably decided that the best approach was to let the sleeping dog lie after Jack McConnell's attempts, now moved into another mode. They passed an act which remains highly controversial called the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, and they at the same time then came under significant uh, criticism that this was criminalising football fans. And again, you see the huge dilemma between do you go for a legislative approach which puts uh, a line under this, or do you actually try to deal with this through fans' behaviour? This time they went for the legislative approach, but they, in, I suppose, trying to balance some of the issue up, they also announced that they would try to develop a community-based approach and establish an advisory group on tackling sectarianism. And that was where I got involved, because we, were, we decided that we had actually got something which hadn't been allowed before. First of all was investigative time. And I think that if there is a lesson in terms of practice, maybe that's something that might be uh, is more important than coming up with quick solutions, is the opportunity to constantly keep this under revision. The question we had to ask, therefore, was what is this and what should you do about it? Those aren't difficult questions, but they are significant questions which you shouldn't rush to too, many, too quick answers on. Uh, second of all, we decided that the... Um, three pillars that we had to deal with were clear. First of all, to get what was going on, research becomes a really critical issue. We have to establish some kind of viable evidence base if we're going to move from emotion or silence to have that conversation. So the value of research was to create that evidence base, to develop practice through actually trying to encourage people to think, well, what would you do about this when you see it? And also to encourage leadership in the institutions which might be able to do something about it. And we can identify those. And it took us 30 months to get on with that, and I suppose the verbs were explore this, report on it, and then try to make sure that those who had responsibility took responsibility for it. So beyond silence in the megaphone, evidence-based and value-led, we had to engage as many people as possible in this. A bit like when Belfast City Council asked uh, what was the most important issue. Uh, when the council was asked, sectarianism didn't appear. When they did a household survey, sectarianism was number one. Actually, when you involve people in civic life and they talk about what are the things which impinge on them, these things start to appear. And so finding ways to do that seems to be very important. Detailed exploration, the idea of trying to put in monitoring of this and to give advice. We also spread out, we give advice on spreading out money. And part of that was based, I suppose, on trying to say... Uh, we have to find ways of developing real practice around this. The sectarianism isn't an it. It's a reality in relationships for young people, in certain communities, in, uh, sometimes in churches, around football, around city, and we have to develop, and for women and men, a different thing, and we had to develop different practice. From, Scotland, from the beginning, partly, I suppose, based on Northern Ireland experience, the notion was, let's do this, but let's try to bring that learning straight back into the mainstream of those professions which have responsibilities for that. And that's what we've been trying to ensure that it doesn't develop as a parallel stream, but it's actually developed inside the mainstreams of those activities. And engage the key issues, who, who, who key people who might have something to say around this. Local government, football, churches, education, police politics. You, the, the list is up there. The Commission of Academic Research was extremely important in this. First of all, quantitative 
uh, analysis of the census and where people were, qualitative in relation to, uh, sorry, the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, putting questions in there, and youth attitudes, and also uh, trying to work out what does this look like when it hits the ground. Qualitative research and the two that we picked were on the impact of parades on community relations in different communities across Scotland, but also uh, on the question of community experience. And there's one, there are several other projects on football and gender running at the moment. Eventually, after some work, we decided we had to give a definition. The first definition we gave in an interim report was so long and rambly that uh, it was uh, almost incomprehensible in itself. But we came up with this. Um, Sectarianism in Scotland is a mixture of perceptions, attitudes, actions and structures. So all of that, and you have to have things which deal with perceptions, attitudes, actions and structures. It's not either an attitude or a behaviour, it's both. And you're going to have to have stuff for that. It involves overlooking, excluding, discriminating through negative behaviour, being abusive or violent. This perception is always mixed with other factors. And I'll leave that to you. We did, however, come down with trying to come up with a sense in which when does this matter? And actually, we decided there were three, not two, not one, but three. First of all, and they went by this, eventually came to these cliches, glass bottles. When it, it's glass ceilings, rather, equality. You have to be able to measure the equality issues that are out there. Second of all, the glass bottles, violence, actually threat, intimidation, hostility, issues around immigration. And glass curtains, maybe is the one which is most difficult. Cohesion issues and interdependence, that actually these matter for the health of communities, whether there's permeability between people or whether people are operating on parallel lines. And if there is an innovation, I think it is around trying to define uh, this is where we should be looking. Uh, in research terms for the actual consequences of sectarianism and inequality, violence and cohesion. And uh, what is clear is that it varies. And so Mike's point, which is that you can't just simply have central policy, is very clear. Okay, research findings. The uh, research findings, I'll just summarise some of them there. First of all, when we asked in the Scottish Social Attitude Survey, 88% thought it was a problem. So it wasn't a small issue. Uh, a problem in the west of Scotland in pockets in particular, so therefore much more difficult to actually define and find national policy around. Uh, there were fewer, but the reality is it was bigger in people's minds as a fear than it may have been in what people were actually experiencing. And that created an issue because uh, then how you deal with this is extremely important, that you deal with it when you see it rather than you try to generate it. Uh, economic differences appear to be declining, so that seems to be important. So... Actually, what we, were, what we were able to build on in Scotland was a consensus that where it hits glass ceilings, glass bottles and glass curtains, you should do something about it. And actually, that consensus was very important. Uh, hate crime um, and, uh, the, the, uh, and the number of incidents there suggest that, that there are incidents in both directions. It's not just anti-Catholicism. There is actually evidence that this is, in violence terms, uh, very clear. 14% reported religious prejudices in their own, and there was acute sensitivity, particularly in that community which felt itself to be the most minority, the Catholic community, the Irish, uh, very largely Irish in the west of Scotland, who felt sectarianism at two levels, both the sense that uh, it was a working class issue, which had violence involved and threat involved, but also that there was a structural issue operating in Scotland in which actually being able to articulate uh, yourself was important, and both of those had to, will have to be addressed if we were to take forward this issue. Um, what contributes, actually, when you ask people what it was, football, parades, and then schools, social media, and churches. Um, in fact, the Offensive Behaviour Football Act, although there's a, a, a part of it, those people who are most targeted by it at football, who absolutely hate it very vociferously, 83% of Scots this year support the legislation, 80% polled support the act, and most people regard the singing of songs which glorify or celebrate the loss of life or serious injury offences. So if you're looking for a definition of what it is you're trying to control, first of all, it's the loss of life and uh, serious injury. Second of all, songs in support of terrorist organisations and songs and chants about people's religious beliefs. Those are the other um, key findings. OK, in terms of the advisory group outcomes, we found there was a consensus for change that actually in Scotland 
you're tr this might be an equalities issue in which you could actually argue that the outcome looks like it begins to disappear, as opposed to you just keep monitoring it. Uh, and that is a, in itself an important outcome, that, it would, that actually you could start to look and see this is almost not existing in the future. Um, that it needs to be dealt with, normalised. That sectarianism will be normalised when it can be dealt with rather than set aside or either magnified through equality legislation, hate crimes, human rights and community development. And our view is these things, that's where the project needs to be, making this normal. That there's sufficient legislation. The role of political leadership is to set strategy, to lead, to monitor, to resource and to legislate. The Institutional leadership, though, becomes absolutely critical, and this is the question. We've essentially said that, that the key players in this, all of whom need to have very clear policy, are local government, education, police, equalities and human rights. Now, all, none of that is new, but all of it says that, that that requires one of two things. Either it will have to be forced, or people will step up to the plate. At the moment, our preference is for people to step up to the plate once this is identified, because we got them to say we recognise the issue. I have to say that remains the, the question which will have to be monitored. Critical social leadership. There are also a set of voluntary space where, it's ex where we need to see progress. Football, cult church, youth, culture, media, and we suggested that they set their own progressive measures to see how does this actually improve over time that uh, the permissive environment for violence is obvious in football and social media. And somewhere along the line, the progress needs to look like that this does not create an environment within which people think violence is somehow or other legitimate. And that is one of the core issues in turning sectarianism off. Residual exclusion uh, needs to be tackled through the equalities framework. The investment in practice development and mainstreaming is crucial. And that anybody who thinks that finding policy on this is soft falls into the ancient trap of thinking this is a question of soft and hard. This is not. This is a question of hard and harder. And this is much harder for policy to get its, its, its grip around because the targets are movable. Yeah. The lessons. We can't copy them. Chronic social issues can't be resolved by pilot projects, community issues and gestures alone. They require a systemic approach. And nobody who thinks that that can be done without systemic approach um, is going to succeed. Progress depends actually on very clearly stated values, including the primacy of the rule of law and the withdrawal of all remaining implicit or tacit permission for violence. Other than that, sectarianism, it, which is about glass ceilings, glass bottles and glass uh, curtains, appears actually to be uh, an absurd goal. The Scottish approach to tackling sectarianism identified equality, violence and threats and social cohesion as the critical measures of health. It's not actually rocket science and I think that that actually could be carried across. Changing attitudes and behaviour on a contentious social issue will take time and persistence, so nobody's expecting a light off, but it does require a systemic buy-in over time. Indicators and milestones may be as important as visions. In other words, there's no point in setting a vision unless you also identify how you're actually making progress in very practical ways. So, a comprehensive policy community has begun to be assembled in Scotland. And I think that that may be something which we need to talk about before we go further on TBUC, is what is the comprehensive policy community which is delivering on this? Second of all, legislation and political leadership are necessary but insufficient. We need to stop under, underplaying the role of, uh, of community activity, but it needs to be read across into mainstream activity in a much more systemic way. Thirdly, long term, that's obvious. Fourthly, the requirement, the only way we can take this out of emotive versus silent is to create some shared evidence base. Research plays an absolutely critical role in making sure that that can happen. And finally, democratic values uh, are visible and are knowable, and they're knowable in measuring glass ceilings, glass bottles, and glass curtains. Thank you very much.